And as you're looking, let me mention a couple of things. You may have noticed uh, a, a new face at the keyboard. Uh, Leslie's in the back. Uh, taking a little vacation today. Uh, I think her voice is taking a vacation as well. And so this is um, Melody's daughter, Ashley, who has been on the keyboard this morning. So please greet her afterwards if you don't know her. That's very appropriate for Mother's Day as well, I think. Worked out pretty well. Uh, I should also mention the grandparents of these ladies who are going to have babies or the babies that are going to be born, uh, Lynn and Leslie. I think they're here somewhere. I think I saw them. Uh, Fagerberg, you probably all know that, but uh, in case not, and I think if I remember right, Dwayne told me, Dwayne, is this fifth or sixth generation of, uh, of your family that's either been baptized, dedicated here? Sixth generation, that's pretty good. And him too, so uh, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty good, and, we, and we're, we're grateful to uh, be able to participate with families in that way, it's wonderful be able to do that. Well, I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 10. On their return, the apostles told him uh, that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. And when the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them, and he spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you this morning, we, uh, we're so thankful for mothers. What a wonderful day to honor them as we do. Uh, we pray. Father, I just, uh, Julie kind of stole my prayer this morning, but I, I want to pray for those who are mothers and uh, Lord, it's a wonderful day in most ways, and yet it's also a day, it's kind of like the holidays. It also brings other feelings in some cases. Moms who have gone, some of us miss our mothers because they're no longer with us. Uh, for others, Lord, they're struggling because they are mothers who have reared children, and perhaps those children are not following you, and they have concerns, and they have, uh, Lord, a, a love for those children, and yet their hearts are their hearts are wounded because they're not sure of the spiritual state of their children, and we pray for them. We ask that you will do a work in those hearts to bring them, Father, to a point of following you. We pray for those as well who have the children at home, but on a daily basis, they wonder, am I getting it right? Well, Lord, I pray you'll give us wisdom. I pray you'll give us a desire to check out your word. If, you, if you're real, as we certainly believe, if your word represents your revelation to us, the best thing we could do is know and understand what you've taught us about how to rear children and do our best to put it into practice. So help those who are perhaps struggling a bit with that as well. Give them confidence. Give them assurance as they pray and commit their children to you on a daily basis and even on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. For those who would love to have children and don't for some reason, whatever that may be, we pray for them, sensitive to their needs, Father, to, uh, number one, be submissive to your will in their life, but we pray that you would open those wombs, that you would provide for that desire. It's that our top desire would be you, but Lord, we you, you place within us these others, and we pray that within your sovereign plan and by your grace, you would provide those things as well. And so on this great Mother's Day, we have much to celebrate. We also have much to pray to you for and to ask you for. Thank you for all the events, Father, of the past week, for the wonderful way that you brought the garage sale together. Lord, so much work, so much effort, so many people contributing and Thank you for the great result. Thank you for holding off the weather today uh, from yesterday. And yet we thank you for the moisture today. Lord, your timing, we would always say it's great, but in this case, it certainly worked to our advantage, and we thank you so much for that. We thank you for bringing Stan and the crew that was in Washington, D.C. last weekend with the honor flight, bringing them all back safely. And Lord, we honor those who serve in our military, and we honor those who honor them. We thank you so much for this vision that you've given 
Stan and Cicely and others. And uh, so we thank you for their safe return. Got so many things coming up, Lord, the VBS, the Reach Camp, all these events when, again, our children will be exposed to the Word of God and will be exposed to opportunities for ministry. Will you bless them, keep them? For those who will be, uh, Lord, are facing significant physical challenges, we pray for them. For you'll be with John as he goes to Mayo soon in the next week or so and uh, begins to prepare for the surgery that we pray will rid his body of cancer, and we ask that your blessing and healing touch will be on his life as well. So many things to thank you for, so many things to pray for. Help us to hold each other up in prayer. Help us to learn to know each other and to love each other and to be concerned. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for all for, for being here today. I know for some of you, that's a little more of a challenge than for others, as uh, you've had some long long weeks here. But as we look at God's Word today, maybe this is the right day to be here as we talk about stepping back a little bit from this passage. College-age young lady arrived home from school complaining about the mileage that her car was getting. And her dad said, well, what, what, you know, how bad is it? What's the, what, what kind of mileage is it getting? And she said, I don't know. And he said, well, honey, it's easy. All you got to do is, you know, just, just note the mileage when you fill the tank up. Note the mileage when you Fill it up again, and then and then subtract or divide the uh, number of miles that you dro drove by the uh, by the number of gallons it took to fill up. It's easy. And she said, "Well, that won't work. Won't work." He said, "Well, what do you mean it won't work? The math is easy." She said, "It's not the math." She said, "The problem is I never have enough money to fill up the tank. <laughs> that could be a problem, right?" And I think a lot of times we feel like we're running on an empty tank, emotionally, sometimes physically, sometimes spiritually. We want to be part of God's work. We want to be useful. We want to think that there's eternal value attaching to our life. But, you know, by the time we've kind of dealt with demanding bosses and dependent children, deserving spouses who aren't getting as much of us as they really should, you know, defective plans that go astray, dire circumstances. We have a lot of things that attack. And pretty soon we feel like we're running on empty and the resources are not in sight. And so there certainly are times when we need to step back. And I want to give you permission to do that as though you needed it from me. I want you to hear from God this morning that there are times when we need to step back. Jesus needed to step back. The disciples here have just returned from their first solo ministry that we looked at a few weeks ago. They're just back and they're excited, but they're also physically and emotionally spent. To add to that, human tragedy has intruded. John the Baptist has been imprisoned for condemning Herod, as you'll recall, for seducing and marrying his brother's wife, stealing her away. And Matthew, if you want to turn back to Matthew 4, Matthew picks up the rest of the story from that point. And in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, we read this. It says, but when Herod's birthday came... I'm sorry, Matthew 14, that'll help a bit. When Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias, that's his new wife, danced before the company and pleased Herod. It's kind of a drunken party, apparently, and the daughter provides this seductive entertainment, perhaps, perhaps at the direction of her mother. So that he, Herod, promised, in verse 7, with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she says, well, can you hang on a second? Let me go out. And she tiptoes out to talk to mom says, what should I ask for? He's, at, he's, he's promised me anything. So prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. John's in prison down below. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. 
And his disciples came and took the body and buried it and they went and told Jesus. I suspect none of us have been to a party quite like that. I hope not. Kind of a gory detail that the Bible gives us here about the death of John the Baptist. And you, re- you recall, John is a cousin, distant cousin of Jesus. He's the forerunner of Jesus, so he was very important in the ministry of Christ. You'll also recall that some of the disciples had been followers, disciples of John, before they switched over to Jesus when Jesus came on the scene. So these are people who knew and were intimately acquainted with him, and now he's met this very awful and untimely death. So it's time to step back. It's time for some reflection to hear the report of the disciples and also to take stock of what's happening. And so Jesus takes them to this little fishing village. It's a, uh, it's a village, Capernaum, where Jesus kind of headquarters up here on the, on, the, on the northwest shore of Galilee. Bethsaida is over here on the northeast shore of the Lake of uh, Tiberias, Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus takes them there. This is out, it's just on the east side of the Jordan River. It's outside of Herod's territory. Jesus knew that Herod was after him, just like he'd been after John the Baptist. So that's where he takes them away for a retreat. There's still things the disciples need to know. And so they go, stepping back, time. We need occasions when we can retreat. Now, as we look at this passage, I want us to see there, I think there's three great lessons here for us on the need and how we should look at the need for rest and for taking time off. The first one is that we need to cherish God's rest. We need to cherish God's rest. Easy to say. And there there probably are a few of us who do that very well, maybe a little bit too well, I don't know. But most don't, especially those of us who are kind of like type A personalities, driven, or even just driven by the needs of life, find it difficult to withdraw. And we need to learn to do that if we haven't already. Notice it says there in verse 10, second part, it says, and he took them and withdrew, withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. The word withdrew there was originally a term that spoke of a military retreat, retreat from the front lines, guys that were sent back for R&R. It's also used in Luke 5, 16, where it says that Jesus would withdraw to desolate places to pray. So Jesus was as busy as he was, as involved in ministry as he was, as intent he was, as he was on accomplishing the mission that the Father had sent him to do, he regularly, now listen, regularly, took time to step back for reflection and prayer. And that's what he's teaching here and that's what he's doing here. Now, I don't know if you ever wondered, I've sometimes wondered this, how come God made us with the need for rest, right? He didn't have to do that. I mean, he could have made us like the Energizer Bunny, right? It just keeps on going, Or the Timex watch that keeps on ticking and it never needs any rest. It doesn't stop. He could have made us that way. No need for sleep. No need for downtime, just continual activity. God could have done that. So why didn't he? Why did he make us so that we have this need for rest? Why did he make us so that, you know, every, every, you know, 12, 16, 18 hours or so, we just, we close our eyes and we just, we're gone. Our consciousness is gone. Why did he make us that way? I think that the way God talks about the Sabbath day, it's pretty clear that the reason that God did this is he, it's kind of a forced slowdown, if you will. I think God knew very well that if we weren't forced to have times of rest, we would not be very good at giving thought to a God that we can't even see. He would be very little part of our existence. Now for some of us, God may be a very little part of our existence anyway, but he's made us in such a way that we at least have the opportunity to step back and reflect because we need it. And so our society builds it in a bit. God desires, listen, we have to understand this. God desires relationship. He's not really so concerned that you're checking off the do's and don'ts on some list. He's not. 
He wants to relate to you as a person. He wants to relate to me as a person. It's relationship that he's looking for. And that doesn't happen if we're just buzzing around all the time and never take time to stop, to rest, to relax, to be refreshed, to be renewed. So the principle of rest is there from the very beginning, right? Remember how from day one, I was going to say it's actually day seven, right? God created in six days, and on the seventh day, what did he do? He rested. Why? Because he's tired? Of course not. What's he doing? He's establishing the principle of rest. He's letting us know this is for our benefit, and the ratio is kind of like six to one. Six days you work, one day you need to rest. But let, me, let me tell you, I, 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 have, and I speak to myself as much as I do anyone else today. We are far too casual with the principle that God really puts a lot of stock in. Listen to this. In the book of Exodus, it says, The Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the children of Israel and say, Above all. So if you want to have a list... Here's number one on the list. Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you know that I, the Lord, sanctify you, set you apart. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it, listen to this, shall be put to death. Are you glad he's not actually following through on that right now today? He says, you profane my Sabbath and you are deserving of death. It is a sign forever between you and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and is refreshed. Sounds pretty important to God, wouldn't you say? More so than probably it is to most of us. The principle of rest. Turn to me, there's, there's some passages in Leviticus, you know, part of the law. I want you to see Leviticus, third book in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, number, t- uh, chapter 25, Leviticus 25. Let's start there. We'll look at a couple of them. Leviticus 25, God provides a rest for the land. Now that sounds a little strange, but... He says, I want the land to rest. The people are to farm for six years, and they and they are to leave the land lie fallow for a year. Now, he anticipates the logical question in Leviticus 25. This is early in the chapter. He talks about that. Now, the question that's logical comes in verse 20. Leviticus 25, verse 20. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? If we may not sow or gather in our crop, he says, this is what I'm going to do. I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. He says, you keep your side of the bargain, I'll keep mine. You need to rest. And the land needs to rest. Six to one ratio. And I want you to leave the land. And it actually goes even further a little later on. He talks about a 50th if every 50 years, there'll be a year of jubilee. So after seven periods of seven years, there's going to be two years in a row in which the land lies fallow. God claims the authority to do this. Look at, look at verse 23 of Leviticus 25. He says, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity for the land is, you know, why is this year of jubilee? Because the land is mine, God says. It's not yours. I know you got a title to it, and I understand you paid for this land, but it's actually mine. You are strangers and sojourners with me. So the principle is, this isn't your land, this is my land. And in fact, everything we own, whatever we think we own, whether it's land or houses or property, even our own bodies, It's not ours, it's on loan. We don't look at it that way often enough. We think of it as being ours. We think of ourselves as being in charge, but God says, no, 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 this is mine. My name is on this. And then he goes on and says, and part of the lease agreement is really this 
this principle of rest. You're violating what is mine if you don't do this. You know, it's interesting that Paul later on in 1 Corinthians 6, we won't look at it, but in 1 Corinthians 6, he appeals for sexual morality on the same basis. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 18, he says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You may think you are. You may think you have rights to dictate what this body does. I have news for you. You don't belong to you. You belong to me. And God goes on in that Old Testament time with the Israelites basically to say this. There's two things that are going to separate you certainly more than that, but at least two that are going to separate you from the rest of the people of the, of the ancient times. One is that you will rest and they won't. And the sex, second is that you will be morally, sexually moral and they won't. And if you know anything about the people of the ancient times, you know that these two things separated Israel big time from the people they were around. God's making the point, we are his own, not our own. Turn to Leviticus 26. If you're in 25, just turn over. Is God serious about these things? Well, he promises beginning in in the early part of Leviticus 26, he promises blessing if they will do what he has asked them to do, but he promises them captivity if they fail. Look at verse 34. He says, then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate while you are in your enemy's land, then the land shall rest. What he's saying is, if you don't rest it yourself, I will. So you need to rest the land. Then he says, then the land shall rest and have its Sabbaths. In verse 35, he says, as long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest, the rest that it did not have on your Sabbath when you were dwelling in it. If you don't rest the land, he's going to remove them from it. And that's exactly, beloved, what happened. If you turn to Ezekiel, don't turn there now, but you can reference it at home. Ezekiel 20. And look at verses, um, beginning of about verse 23 of Ezekiel 20. And you'll find out that when they went into captivity later on to Babylon, they were in captivity for 70 years to make up for 490 years that they didn't obey the Sabbath. So what they wouldn't do, God did. The principle, don't be deceived. Paul tells us, Galatians, right? Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. (laughs) We think we can get away with disobeying the commands of God. Let me tell you, some of, you have, yeah, some of you face this now, some of you will face it, but you can, you can violate the principles of God for some period of time, but the day, will come, day of reckoning will come. And this simple principle of physical rest, some of you are probably suffering even as you sit here this morning because you're violating the principle. You're not taking the one day in six to do something different and to, be, to, to, to let it be holy to God in the sense that you're, Pursuing God in terms of being with other believers and in the sense that you're resting. Not doing what you do most of the time. You're violating the principles of God. You're not taking regular times to vacation, to retreat. It will catch up with you. It's just a question of time, right? And that's what God is teaching in all of this. You know, and it's tough in our society. I understand. I Believe me, I fully understand. It's like the two guys walking down the street, right? And and one of them says, thanks to computers and cell phones, he says, wireless technology, I'm expected to work almost anywhere, anytime. Some of you are in that boat. I realize that. And if you don't, set the boundaries. And say, these are the hours when I'm available and these are hours when I'm not. The job will overtake you principle of rest is built into the creation that God has made, and we can only violate it at our own risk. But now turn to the book of Hebrews, because I want to see, I want you to see one more thing. Hebrews chapter 4. 
to cherish God's rest. Hebrews chapter 4. Because typically, this is kind of typical of the Bible, physical realities generally are pointing to some greater spiritual reality. And the same is true when it comes to this principle of rest. So when God is saying, I want you to cherish the rest that I give you, there's a, there's a bigger picture even than the physical rest. Hebrews 4, and let's look beginning in verse, well, let's look at verse, beginning verse 9. And the writer of the Hebrews says this, he says, So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Now that sounds a little strange, but let me interpret it and, and you'll see what he's saying here is very simple. It's just one more way of teaching a great biblical truth, which is you have absolutely nothing by way of works to offer to God. Not by means of salvation. What he's saying here is there's only one way to be saved. There's only one way to come into a relationship with God. There's only one way to become right with him, and that is to leave all of your works outside and enter the rest of God. God's done it all. In the person of Jesus Christ, God has provided salvation for us and there's nothing, there's no way, no attempt to keep the law, no attempt to do good things. There's no amount. You know, people come to church and think, well, I gotta go to church, I gotta get right, or I gotta do this moral thing. And we have all these moral, moralistic things going through our mind. Listen, after salvation, is, you know, God wants us to do the things that represent him from a heart that loves him. But before salvation, your works are as useless as they could possibly be. Paul says, everything good that I had, I count it like rubbish. It's no good. I throw it all away because I need to come to Christ and rest in what he's done. That's the only way we can come by faith. To say, Lord, I give you all the stuff that I think was going to help me and I give it to you and I rest in him. That's what he wants us to do. That's where he wants us to be. That's how we come to salvation, that's how we come to faith in Christ. Listen, it's really simple. It's either we rest in what he's done or we die eternally. It's that simple. That's what this verse is teaching. You can't save yourself. You can only rest in what God has already done. And so to cherish the rest of God, do you see it's important physically? It's way more important spiritually. That we cherish the rest that God gives us. Second principle, back in Luke, if you can find your way back there again, Luke chapter 9. Second principle is we need to credit God's power. Credit God's power. Verse 10 of Luke 9. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. Now kind of put on your thinking cap for a moment and, and, and picture this. The guys are reporting in, right? It's sharing time. And they're going around in a circle and everybody's telling what happened. But Luke's phrasing here is very suggestive, especially in light of what's going to follow. They told Jesus all that they had done. And in the back of Jesus' mind is, is, you know what's going on is, really? Really? So you cast out these demons? You did this healing? You saved these people? What's Jesus thinking? You didn't do any of that. I did it through you. The Father did it through you. And he's seeing that they have this really important lesson to learn. They're thinking, they're excited about it. They're thinking, wow, we are great. We can now heal people. We can cast out demons. We can do all these wonderful things. He even, Matthew tells us, that he even allowed them to raise some people from the dead. No, that's pretty hard for that power not to go to your head, right? It'd be pretty easy. But they needed to realize, no, it's not us. They were instruments. Yes, God uses human instrumentality, but God does the work. And they needed to learn that. And that's what, that's what the feeding of the 5,000 is. We'll see. It's what it's all about. You think it was about feeding those people that were hungry that day? It was, was not. I mean, that was a nice side issue. But the big issue was to teach the disciples that they couldn't do anything without him. That's what's coming up. 
We did it. Jesus is saying, no, you didn't. God did it through you. You've got to credit God's power. Listen, you'll rest a lot easier when you do that. We must cherish God's rest. And we do that by crediting God's power. We will rest a lot easier when we realize it's God working through us. When we stop taking responsibility for the results and begin to leave that in God's hands. Sure, we need to be doing what he asks us to do. But we don't save people. We don't bring people to church. We don't, can't do anything good except as God is doing it through us. So t- turn with me to Zeph- Ze- Zechariah. Or Zechariah. Well, so next to the last in the Old Testament. So kind of easy to find. Get to Malachi, turn him backwards and go to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. The, the background here. Is, is a, it's a beautiful illustration of this truth. It's in Zechariah 4, we're in about the year 520 BC. We've arrived backwards there in our time ship, and God's people had been taken captive by Babylon. 606 BC, 70 years later, in accordance with God's promise that He had promised through Jeremiah, they are about to be released. The Babylonians have, in the meantime, been overtaken by the Medes and Persians. A guy named Cyrus the Great arrives on the scene. Now, Cyrus the Great's an interesting guy because he's the one that says to the Jews, okay, you can go back home and go back to Jerusalem. What's really interesting is that Isaiah prophesied that a guy named Cyrus would do that 150 years before it actually happened. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 20, 44, verse 28, and Isaiah 45, verse 1, he names Cyrus by name and says, I'm going to use Cyrus to send you back home. Cyrus is well known to secular history. He's known as Cyrus the Great or Cyrus the Mede. And you can read him about it in your secular history books. And God is saying, oh, he was just my instrument. He's my servant. I'm going to use him. The best thing he's ever going to do in his whole life, he's going to release the Jews from their captivity. That's his big point. And God does it. It happens exactly. You know what it's like? It's just like, it's as though at the time uh, uh, that George Washington is born, 1832, that God would say, hey, there's going to come a guy along in 1860 who's going to release all the slaves. His name's going to be Abraham Lincoln. Nobody's ever heard of him. That's what God does here in this passage of Scripture to give us further indication of who he is. And so so Cyrus comes along and he releases them and they go back to Jerusalem. It's been destroyed. 70 years it's laid there and nothing going on. And they begin to rebuild. They're rebuilding the temple. It's at the heart of their worship. The great temple of Solomon has been destroyed, but it's, it doesn't go well. And when we get to Zechariah chapter 4, the building project has been lying dormant for 16 years. Nothing's been going on. But through Zechariah, the prophet, God has a message for Zerubbabel, who is a descendant of David. He's not a king, but he's a governor at this point. There's a message for him, and he has a message for Joshua, the high priest. So let's begin in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. And the angel who talked with me came again. And he woke me like a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it and with seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right hand of the bowl and one on its left. And I said to the angel who talked to me, what are these, my Lord? The angel who talked to me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. So what are they? Well, here's what they are. The lampstand represents the people of God that have come back from captivity and that are trying to rebuild this temple. The two olive trees are sources of oil to light and to sustain the lampstand. Now, oil in the Old Testament almost inevitably represents the Holy Spirit. You can almost count on it. When you find reference to oil, it's the Holy Spirit. My old seminary professor, Dr. Charles Feinberg, wrote a book on Zechariah commentary, and he identified many reasons that oil is used to represent the Holy Spirit. He said it warms, it lubricates, it smooths, it invigorates, it lights, it adorns, it polishes. 
There's a lot of things that are reasons that it's a great representation of the Holy Spirit. And Zerubbabel needed all of those here. He'd been beset by problems internally and externally. The people couldn't get along. They were fighting with each other. There were enemies from the outside, from Samaria, that didn't want this temple built. And so there'd been all kinds of opposition. He was beset by trouble. And now we have these olive trees with the oil of the Holy Spirit flowing through them. So what are the olive trees? Well, some have said that was Zerubbabel and, and Joshua. But if you look down in verse 12, look down in verse 12, you'll see that these two guys are branches of the olive trees. They're not the trees themselves. What are the trees? The trees, beloved, are the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the trees and he is the olive oil that's being produced by them. But it's flowing through the branches. Joshua and Zerubbabel, things are about to be made right. And so the Holy Spirit is ready to go. Now notice verse six. Then it said, the angel said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. In other words, you got this big task ahead of you. It looks impossible, Zerubbabel. Going to even it out. It's going to fall before you, but not because of you, not because of your might, not because of your power, but because of the Holy Spirit. And he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Until now, the problem has been it's only been by human effort. People have been doing this, trying to do it all on their own. The people have forgotten to seek God's help in building his house. The, the, the flow of oil had stopped. But in chapter 3, the, Joshua, the high priest, if you read it, you'll find he'd been cleansed from his sin. You say, the high priest? Yeah, priests are just as sinful as preachers. We're all sinful. Had to be cleansed. Had to become a believer. As they're cleansed, they are now ready for the Holy Spirit to flow through them. And so God says, Zerubbabel, you're going to finish the task. And he did. And four years later, powered by the Holy Spirit, they finished. Now, did that mean the people quit working? They just st stand back and say, oh, we're well, going to watch the Holy Spirit do this. Is that what they did? Of course not. They still had to go out and gather stones. They had to put them together. They had to clear the land. They had to do all the things that you do to build the temple, right? But now it was being done not in their own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. All the back-breaking work still had to happen. And it's just like running a garage sale. All the back-breaking work still has to happen. But we pray for the Holy Spirit to be in this, right? And so we get a great day yesterday, and we get the rain that we need today. Isn't that wonderful? Because the Holy Spirit is in it. So we do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the results are up to God. The application is clear. The disciples had labored hard at their ministry, but the results were God's, and they're going to have to learn that. I love how David Platt, some of you have read the book Radical. If you haven't, you should. Um, wonderful book. And if you've read that, read Radical together. And... Um, That'll take you further, but, but David Platt, wonderful young pastor, when he was considering a, a church in Birmingham, Alabama, that, was, that, was, that he was candidating for, he got down there and he said, man, I got enamored of the money and the talent and the global vision of this church, and I thought, man, what could we not do for God? And then he says this, he said, I have since discovered that this was a woefully wrong-headed way to think. The reality is it doesn't matter how many resources the church has. The church that I lead can have all the man-made resources that one can imagine, but apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, such a church will do nothing of significance for the glory of God. Same is true of any church, isn't it? Of any job, of any life. Apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, we're just doing something that's of whatever temporal value, nothing eternal about it until we submit it to him. He goes on and says, the reality is that the church I can lead, that I lead can accomplish more during the next month in the power of God's Spirit than we could in the next hundred years apart from his provision. Our 
How much do we seek the power of the Holy Spirit, beloved? When we're doing whatever we're doing in the name of Christ for Him, whatever we think it is, are we really seeking, praying, committing it to Him? You take the baby bottles back there. You take them home and you start to fill them. Do you pray about that? Are you asking the Lord to take this little bit, whatever number of dollars it comes up with, and use it for eternal purpose? If you're not, it's useless. You might as well not take one. We minister through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul urged, keep on continually all the time being filled with the Holy Spirit. Everything has to be submitted to him. Every minute of every day. And to forever going to properly cherish God's rest, we have to credit God's power through the person of the Holy Spirit and realize that the eternal results come from him. Platt's, Platt's church is shaking the world for God. So can any church. It's doing the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. One final thing in this passage, quickly, we need to cultivate God's compassion. Cultivate God's compassion. Back in uh, Luke 9, Jesus and his disciples have withdrawn to this resort area outside Bethsaida, but the word quickly filters out. They left Capernaum up here on this end, and they went over here, and word filtered out. Now, the disciples and Jesus went in a boat, and so they they went over, it's about four miles by boat. The people came running around by land. It's about eight miles by land. And they're doing this, by the way, on the day that he's going to feed the 5,000. So you can see why they were getting hungry by the end of the day and why they didn't have any food. But here they come, and they show up, and Jesus is just getting the retreat started, and we get to verse 11. It says, when the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God, and he cured those who were in need of healing. Serious interruption to the retreat, wouldn't you say? A 21st century, you know, time management expert would have advised that they should tell them, sorry, folks. I hope you'll understand. I know you'll excuse us, but we're near exhaustion. We've been doing ministry. We need a little time to be alone. Come back in a few days. We need, we need some time alone. Who could have faulted Jesus for that? But his compassionate heart had no such thought. Don't you love the words? He welcomed them. Though they were infringing on badly needed rest, Jesus put their needs first, not grudgingly, but lovingly. Do you see yourself there? I have a hard time seeing myself there. Don't you want to be like Jesus? I want to be like Jesus, but I'll tell you, I can, I, I'm, I'm good at showing compassion when it's sort of built into the schedule, you know? Hospital visits this afternoon, some of our shut-ins, whatever, got it in the schedule. And then you get a different kind of call, and it's an interruption. Not nearly so compassionate, not, not nearly so ready to go, not nearly so willing, yet Jesus does this with enthusiasm. Man, to have the heart of Jesus, you know, able to put aside inconvenience to minister. Do we need, did we, do we need rest? Yes. Jesus knew that. But when he puts opportunity and he puts need right in our path, what's the, what's the right thing to do? Respond to the need. Respond to the need, and if it burns you out, it burns you out, but respond to the need. That's the principle. Those needs of others supersede sometimes our need for rest. I love, let me close with this. The, the, Henry Luce was the founder and publisher of Time Magazine. Many of you have read about Henry Luce for many years. Well, one night, he and his wife, Claire Booth Luce, who was kind of equally famous after a while, I think she was a senator, wasn't she eventually from one of the states? They were having dinner with General Douglas MacArthur. So it's pretty high level stuff, right? And they're in Manila, it's in the 30s. That's where MacArthur was stationed during that period of time. And they're in his penthouse having dinner one night. And as Mrs. Luce reported on it later, 
She said that they went to dinner and MacArthur talked for an hour and a half straight. She said he never let up. And she said it irritated my husband because he wanted to talk for an hour and a half straight. <laughs> Blew him away. If you know anything about those egos, you know that was true. So as they were going home, they got into this elevator that was taking them down on the way and, and Luce pushed the stop button right in the middle and he said to his wife, he said, you know, I've got to decide right now whether MacArthur is the, is the greatest military genius in the history of the world or whether he's the greatest egotist in the history of the world. It took about 30 seconds and then he punched the button again and his wife looked at him and said, well, okay, which is it? He said, it's both. He's both. And that's what this passage is teaching us that we need to be. We need to be those who rest, but we need to be ready. It's, it, it's not either or, do you see? We've got to be both and. We've got to plan for those times away. We have to plan so that our day ends at some reasonable time as a general rule. We have to plan so that we have a day out of seven that's devoted to rest and relaxation and to our relationship with the Lord. That's the biblical pattern. Beloved, at the same time, we have to be ready. And the Lord puts the need before us. We've got to be ready. Hearts that are compassionate, hearts that can move. And God says, I need you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage. It's a challenge we, we acknowledge. We're, um, well, we, we, we fall short in a lot of ways. We're, we're not very balanced. We overwork. And then when the, when the needs are presented to us, if they're an interruption, Lord, that's bad. And we may even respond, but it's not with the right attitude. It's not with the heart of genuine compassion like you had. Help us to be like you. I want to be like you. Lord, we want, to, we want to care about people like you do. Less of us, more of them and more of you. Kind of think of how when you were asked, how do you, you, know, what's, what's, how do you summarize the law? Your, 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 your answer was profound. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love others as yourself. <clears throat> Help us to do that. Not only for our sake, but for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and for the sake of those around us who need us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we close our service? Singing to